What's up, short attention span history nerds? I'm Mike Perry, and you're watching 10 Minute History. Have you ever had a hankering for a nice roasted shoulder or hindquarter? I mean, who doesn't love a good cookout? As long as it's beef, deer, or hog, I'm in. But in 1933, Russia, it was human. Nah, I'm out. I mean, what beer and lawn games go with human? In the spring of 1933, a small group of lumber barges pulled up to the Nazinsky Island. Only these lumber barges weren't carrying wood, they were carrying people. It offloaded about 3,000 settlers in order to construct a special settlement. But by the time the first round of settlers were unloaded, 23 were already dead. And that's not a good start to any construction project. Now, it seemed in February of 1933, the head of the OGPU secret police and the head of the Gulag labor camp system proposed a self-described grandiose plan to Joseph Stalin, the general secretary of the Soviet Union, an all-around nice guy according to today's youths, to resettle up to two million people to the Siberian and Kazakhstan in special settlements. And by resettle, I mean kidnap and force them to live on the island. These new settlers were to bring over a million hectare of virgin land to the specially populated regions into production and become self-sufficient within two years. And if you're wondering what a hectare is, it's how fast the Millennium Falcon ran the Kessel Run. No, that's Parsec. Uh, let me Google hectare real quick. Okay, it's about 2.5 acres. That's all the math I'm doing today. The plan was based on the experience of departing two million other agricultural workers to the same areas that had occurred in the previous three years as part of an earlier political repression policy. However, unlike the previous plan, resources available to support the new plan were severely limited by the ongoing famine in the Soviet Union. Despite this, the new plan was approved by the Council of People's Commissars of the USSR on March 11, 1933. Shortly after the plan's approval, the number of prospective deportees was reduced to one million. The original plan targeted several types of people living in the agricultural area of the Soviet Union's western territories, such as the Ukraine SSR and the Lower Volga, North Caucasus, and Black Earth region in the, U in the Russian SFSR. Instead, many of the deportees were people from Moscow and Leningrad who had been unable to obtain an international passport and just so happened to be walking by in public when one of the body snatcher vans drove by. The passportization campaign in the Soviet Union began with a decision by the Soviet Politburo on December 27, 1932 to issue international passports to all of its residents of major cities. One of their objectives was to cleanse Moscow, Leningrad, and the other great urban centers of the USSR of superfluous elements not connected with production or administrative work as well as kulaks, criminals, and other antisocials and socially dangerous elements. They also didn't like mimes, but who does? Most of the deportees were primarily socially harmful elements, meaning they were former merchants and traders, peasants who had fled the ongoing famine in the countryside, petty criminals, or anybody who didn't fit into the idolized worker class structure of communism. You know, normal people. Due to their backgrounds, they were not issued passports, meaning they could be arrested and deported from the cities after a mock administrative procedure. Most were deported within two days. That's Russian due process for you. The new settlers were forced on the island with little to no provisions. Without tools, shelter, or food, and surrounded by armed guards who were quick to shoot anyone who tried to escape, the prisoners quickly fell victim to starvation, disease, violence, and brutal elements. And still, additional barges continued to pull up to the island. Order on the island quickly broke down and devolved into classes. The majority of the population were city dwellers who knew nothing about basic agricultural practices such as clearing and cultivating that would make the island properly habitable. Aside from hanging out in coffee shops and pontificating on how bad life is, 
they had no real life skills. The sparsity of resources led to gangs forming who began using violence to dominate the settlers. People were frequently murdered in fights over food and money, and the bodies of those in possession of anything of value such as a gold tooth, gold fillings, and crowns were often looted. The guards established their own reign of terror, extorting settlers and executing people for minor offenses, despite being apathetic towards the gangs. The guards were also assigned to keep the settlers in and killed people who attempted to escape. Even the doctors sent to monitor the island's population who were supposed to have protection began to fear for their lives. I guess a stethoscope and a tongue depressor doesn't really make for a great defense weapon. The lack of proper food and the frequency of death by late May led to cannibalism becoming widespread to the point that settlers eventually began murdering individuals for the sole purpose of consuming them. Even people of high moral status began killing others to eat them. When in Rome, numerous gruesome incidences of cannibalism were reported, so many in fact that locals came to call the island Cannibal Island. By August 1933, at least 4,000 of the 6,700 people were dead. A resident of Nazino recalled, once a woman from the island was brought into our house, she was being taken to another camp. The woman was taken into the back room to spend the night, and I saw that her calves had been cut off. I asked her, and she said, they did this to me on the island of death. They cut them off and they cooked them. All the meat on her calves were cut away. Her legs were freezing because of this, and she wrapped them up in rags. I don't know how she was able to move on her own. She looked like a very old woman, but she was just a little over 40. Now that's nasty. And also, dibs on future movie rights. Calling dibs is a legally binding contract in America, so hands off, Disney. The Nazinski tragedy was the product of pitiless communism. Communism doesn't care for the individual as much as it does for the state. But what communism fails to realize is that the state is made up of groups, which are made up of individuals. The deconstruction of one destroys the whole system. I guess that's why there's no successful communist countries. As was standard practice in Stalin's gulags, common criminals were mixed in among the political prisoners as a means of maintaining an atmosphere of terror. Soviet documents preserved in the Gulag Museum in Tomsk records the interrogation of some of these criminals who were at Nazinsky Island. One recording goes as follows. One was asked if he ate human meat. No, that's not true, he answered. I only ate livers and hearts. As for details, he said, it was very simple. Just like shashlik, we made skewers from willow branches, cut into pieces, stuck the meat on the skewers, and roasted it over the campfire. I picked those that were not quite living, but not quite dead, he added. It was obvious that they were about to go that in a day or two they'd give up. So it was easier for them that way. Now, quickly, without suffering, for another two or three days. Oh, what a heartwarming story. I hope he cooked the person to at least 160 degrees Fahrenheit to prevent bacteria growth, then stored the leftovers in airtight Tupperware at at least 41 degrees Fahrenheit. I wouldn't want to hear of any of the cannibals getting a tummy ache. Others described women who were tied to trees while men cut off their breasts, calves, and other body parts. Another common criminal whose interrogation survived bragged of beating prisoners to extract the gold from their dental work. I guess they developed a refinery and banking system on the island. Actually, when asked why he stole the gold, he said, in order to get smokes, people need to smoke. From the guards, you could get a matchbook of tobacco or two whole newspapers for rolling cigarettes. The disaster on Cannibal Island was so horrifying that a local communist instructor named Vasily Belchinko set out on his own initiative to investigate in July of 1933. He interviewed dozens of people and wrote an 11 page report that he sent to Moscow. His report was stamped top secret and only came to light in 1994. They burned to death alive while sleeping close to fires. They died from exhaustion and the cold. 
Immediately after the snow and frost came the rains and the freezing winds, he continued, and the people were still left without food. Every fourth or fifth day, some rye flour was brought into the island and distributed to the settlers, a few hundred grains each. After getting the rations, the people ran to the water and mixed it, just ate the flour as it was, and since it was powder, many of them suffocated to death. Nazinsky Island was finally evacuated in July 1933, when Velichenko reached it in August. All the settlers were gone. The grass on the island was head high, he wrote in his report, but locals who went there to gather berries returned after discovering corpses in the grass and stick shelters full of skeletons. In 1989, the Tomps branch of the Memorial Human Rights Group set an expedition to Nazinsky to gather oral histories. I went there to cut hay, a Nazino resident told the memorial team about her trip to Nazinsky after the camp had been abandoned. I saw people washing their hands. I was holding my nose and thinking, what are they doing? They would wash their hands and then run back up. I saw that they were collecting gold teeth. There was a state store that they took the gold to. Anyone who had gold took it there. They had some nice clothes, macaroni, good food. Valachenko report caused a sensation in Moscow. The Communist Party sent a special commission to Nazino to investigate and the facts of the report were largely confirmed. Several officials of the former camp were reprimanded and sentenced to prison terms ranging from, now get this, one to three years. That'll show them. Valenchko's report was labeled secret and tucked away in the archives. Valachenko himself was fired from his party job and labeled a snitch. He later became a journalist and gained some fame as a war correspondent during World War II. He traveled with the Red Army all the way to Berlin. After the war, he wrote several novels, singing the praises of the transformation of Siberia under the Soviet government. He never wrote anything else about Cannibal Island. Let's not kid ourselves. He couldn't write anything else about Cannibal Island because the Soviet Communist Party wouldn't allow him freedom of press. Now here's the real sad part. The 2,000 or so survivors of Cannibal Island were sent to labor camps where it's believed that they all died due to various health conditions or murders. So that's it. That's the extremely sad and depressing story of communist Russia attempting to build an infrastructure on a tiny island in 1933. We can only hope to learn from history. If we're not, we're doomed to repeat it. If you enjoy quick historical videos, please consider subscribing to 10 Minute History if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Until next time.